Check one, two. Check one, two. All right, let's get this party started. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, so we're going to uh, just start talking about the um, the the platform book. Um, we're going to talk about how we're going to start it, and so the whole the whole the whole purpose of it is that uh, we're we're coming up with a map of ways to. Um, we're coming up with a map of ways to um, how to seek how to seek God, at least from our perspective. How to seek how to seek Him or how to find Him, both. Both. Because I I do think if I'm if you're hearing something, just let me know mid mid recording so we don't go the whole thing. But mm-hmm. I do think there's a difference between seeking and finding. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think a lot of it has to do with perspective. Okay. Yeah. So, and again, this is from our account and this will probably yeah. be, this will probably be, um, many times rewritten, <laughs> but at least we can start getting the, um, the steps down. Yeah. And so, so maps, Map of ways to let's ex- let's just experience God. Let's not necessarily. F- yeah, I mean we can. Oh, th- I'm that'll, just doing that'll this for be, my own. Yeah, that'll be a generalization, and then yeah. we'll, we'll pinpoint it later. But I'd say we just start discussing well, what we what we think those things are, and then we can start we can start itemizing those things from uh, maybe what we think is most um, valuable, um, at least to start with. I mean, how do we start? So we can yeah. only really, we can obviously only speak from our own experiences. Yeah. So let's try really hard not to, um, uh, let's, let's not fantasize anything or, or be too idealistic. Let's just talk from our own personal experiences and then we'll, we'll write down what we agree on and not, um, we'll go from there. Well, not only that, because you're talking about the content of the book when you say that, right? Yeah. Okay, so so not only that, I agree with that, but also for sake of the viewers, let's we're, we're just talking out loud. That I mean, <laughs> we literally <laughs> as opposed to talking uh not out loud. Yeah. No, like this is like a soundboard. We're we're brainstorming. Yeah, out loud. Instead of instead of trying to be extremely like format like, yeah, have the, have a rigid structure of how this is happening. This is we're recording this. We could be doing this without recording it, but we we decided to incorporate this as part of the platform. So, yeah. um, I see we just, and that's what it is. It's just kind of um, raw. Yeah, which is really cool because we get to see the evolution of this thing. Yeah, right? exactly. It's and, so and that, yeah, it's it's a good it's a really good thing because we can, and that's why there'll probably be multiple versions because we'll we might be able to um do like subcategories of bull of uh, chapters or whatever we want the steps and go further i think we'll go very further much further in detail on certain on specific yeah. steps which you can you know if we start to talk about uh, things like subconscious programming then imagine that that could be a whole that could be a whole book in itself yeah and not only that but if you think about it um when you read books the authors allude to other books that they've written, mm-hmm. like even Bruce Lipton, you know, yeah. like he's in um, the honeymoon effect. He references yeah. the biology of Which belief. Which I'm sure will do a lot. So yeah, my point though <clears throat> is that we could have a whole nother book on a chapter. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and yeah. in that chapter we could say reference this book. Yeah. Something <clears throat> interesting. Um, I just think it's worth saying because it has nothing to do with, excuse me, necessarily with what, um, with what we're doing tonight, mm-hmm. but something that's cool or not cool, just interesting is, um, with Christianity, with anything, with anything at all ideas, we evolve, right? Like we believe one thing at a certain age and then through experience and perspective, yeah. we change it. Right. And um, you got to be careful with that because 
you got to be wise and know that what we're saying now we could we could be right refuting in 10 years exactly and so uh, that and that's why this is good to uh, have a session like this to uh, bounce ideas off each other and say look I don't think that's as um, vital as you think or maybe that's just not a step um, so I think I think uh, by us doing by us doing it like this we'll be able to really hammer uh, hammer out the hopefully time um, structure um, no um, I don't want to say timeless but um Um, I I can't think of the word I'm I'm thinking of, or I can't think of the word. Are you talking about the time frame of this whole thing? No, no, no. I'm just saying that, um, it, the relevancy behind what we say. Uh, hopefully, we can at least start it. Hopefully, what we put down now will be relevant in, yeah, um, many years to come. And that's the thing. It's like, look, you read the Bible. The Bible's thousands of years old, but how old is the law really? It's 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 eternal. It's, yeah. There is no mm-hmm. beginning or end. Um, I mean, you can argue that, but what I'm trying to say is that it's something that lasts forever, like yeah. the law. And so that's the kind of thing that um, me personally sought in order to uh, um, be, be become whole again, or to orient myself in the world in a way so that I I know what foundation to build my thinking on yeah so you know you're saying how when you're young you you go through these things of you know when you're young first off you're totally inexperienced but when you're young you hold on to certain ideas and and it's these things that we hold on to that just kind of carry us along and whatever those things are is what it is but it's really your the the narrative you uh, persistently rehearse to yourself yep. every single day and we can get into all that stuff so all right look hey real quick were you gonna say something do you have a thought yeah okay go. But it, but it, you can go ahead and say what you're gonna say cause well i was gonna piggyback off what you just said because maybe even in the in the book in the beginning of the book we talk about that because i think that's so so um fundamental mm-hmm. if you don't understand that you see things through a lens which is specific to your upbringing and your um, uh, experiences. And if if you don't understand that you're seeing through that lens mm-hmm. which is made up of those experiences, then you're... Did you see, hear that shift? Then you're going to... Then you're going to th- operate under this idea that you're absolutely right and that um, that how you see things is objective. Yes. And it's not. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so funny because if I'm seeing a truth through a lens and I believe it's, it's an absolute truth and then because of an experience that happens, the lens gets either filtered, right. changed, right. or whatever. Yeah. And then I completely... Or you know, another lens gets added. Exactly. It's just like layers of lenses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that is so that is incredibly fascinating because um it'd be it'd be so interesting to dissect and be able to articulate what those lenses are. Mm-hmm. What is it really? How how is it that we see things differently and our experiences completely affect that? Well, okay, I mean just to just to give one clear super easy example Think about homosexuality. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, like, when we were growing up, we were on the tail end of homosexuality being like, oh, my God, like leprosy. You know leprosy in the Bible? Mm-hmm. Like, you couldn't even be around a leper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, you, mm-hmm. you, like, they cast him out of the villages. Yeah. Um, we, like, when we were growing up, we were on the tail end of, of like, homosexuality being like, don't even talk about it. Mm-hmm. Like, don't even associate with mm-hmm. homosexuals. And now, and that doesn't mean everybody believed that. That just means like the population. Now we're in an era or a generation where like there's this movement of, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, what is it like um, love wins, you know, like 
like, I don't know, homosexual friendly, you know? Oh, yeah, man. I uh, Today I was, well, not today, but the other day I was at uh, the Starbucks that I go to quite often. Um, you can see that culture completely um, being uh, transparent. Yeah. In, in that specific location. They're probably doing it in all of them, but the one that I go to, um, you can see the, the flags mm-hmm. um, everywhere. And then they also have a plaque, uh, like a billboard that has the story of two of the p- workers there who got married and they're, they're both, um, you know, they're women. So, um, it's, it's definitely just, it's very, it's being very, um, open in our yep. culture. And well, um, so, so real quick, yeah, where are we going with that? By is, way? Okay. So regardless of how you personally view homosexuality, yeah. if you have, let's just say, that you are in a religion that mm-hmm. condemns mm-hmm. homosexuality, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you have two people that are in that religion. One that has a son or a daughter that is a homosexual is probably going to interpret that religion through that lens. Absolutely. Yeah. And that love of for those children. Yeah. It's a, and so, yeah. so it's, it's a lot easier for that person that has the, the son or daughter to say, well, no, God, God didn't mean this when he wrote that, or that's not what that means sure. and whatever. And then the other person to not have that lens and be like, no, you know, this yeah. is, this is the way. So I think it's, I think it's experience, you know, mm-hmm. like you were, you were asking like how, um, like to understand or how can we understand that better? But I think that's like the fundamental thing is, uh, people's experiences drive those lenses, and if if you don't, if you're not aware of that, then you're going to be um, ignorant mm-hmm. to to your own lens. And yeah, that's I'm telling you, man, that is dangerous. It is dangerous, <clears throat> and I feel like that's. I mean, that's something. You know, that's an interesting uh, subject. Now, the thing that the thing that I feel like is is most important is getting down to, as far as the book goes, is getting yeah. down to the 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 truths, the the God created truths, and you can look at that across a whole uh, many different um, fields, you know, but specific to being a human being and having a mind, body, and soul, it's, we need those rules to, or those laws to help us live life on this planet. Or, or even more, like, how do I know that there's not more out there? I mean, man, today on the way here, I was driving and I was thinking how, how incredibly, um, affected we are by our culture and we grow up eventually addicted to the things that our culture teaches us. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely, like, dude. So I'm always, I'm always wondering, are, am I and are we as uh, a whole body of people um, living life, th- living life, I don't want to say the way we're supposed to. I'm just saying, where does our evolution stop in our consciousness? Man. So, why don't we start with the first, the first phase or the first chapter of what um, we think is the most important? It's it's interesting. It's it's so interesting to me how like. Um, Just, I'm just thinking about like our whole lives, how like in sync we've been as far as like, I don't know, just like thinking, you know. You like, mean you personally? Yeah. 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 Um, uh, because I was just, I'd just been pondering that for the last two weeks, mm-hmm. like that specific idea, mm-hmm. and um, I, you know, I watched a movie that like two weeks ago, two weeks ago that shed a completely different light on life mm. and how how one person leads you know their lives 
and from the outside in, it looks pretty awesome. It's kind of just this, um, this idea of, um, being free spirited and, and not caring what other people think, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. And it got me thinking like, man, who said this is right and this is wrong? Yeah. Who said that? Be- or, yeah. With, with any, like, man, um, you know, I, I mean, with so many things, like for example, I mean, I don't even know why I just came up with this, but like how we dress, mm. you know, like mm. with things matching, mm-hmm. like cl- colors matching mm-hmm. and, um, what, you know, whatever, like, uh, in our church and, in, in 514 church, um, there, there are a lot of young people and I, you know, I have a 17 year old daughter and she's very trendy too. And I'm telling you, man, what they are wearing is in my opinion so unattractive like um my daughter you know she wears like um like i think she called them like boyfriend jeans like they're 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 actually a thing i think they're called boyfriend jeans or something like that does she actually wear her boyfriend no but they're like they're just they look like guys jeans and they're you know baggy and they're cut up and like these, they're you know those charcoal colored jeans, like mm. uh, like black and gray, mm. wearing them up past their belly button, mm. just like kind of like seventies style stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's coming back, but but I look at it, you know, as an older person, yeah. I'm I'm just I'm like that's not I don't like the way that looks. It's not hip to me. It's yeah. not cool. Remember when we used to wear jinkos? Yeah, I mean with the chains, dude. The the Those are pant so legs stupid. were that big. Yeah, you couldn't even walk in them. So my my point in that that stupid tangent was who who decides s- decides yeah. that, and then makes you feel uncomfortable mm-hmm. because you don't conform. Yeah, well that's the thing too. We're social animals, right? So we <coughs> we um we 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 need to feel a part of a group, and. The group is getting, the group seems smaller and smaller because of what what it seems like everybody's paying attention to. So it's, it seems, man, I, gosh, man, there's so much stuff to talk about. It's, I know. it's so ridiculously <laughs> in depth. The whole thing. Look, I wanted, I wanted to just like the things that the thing that I've been thinking about the most mm-hmm. is get comfortable, dude. The the incredible, the 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 phenomena of reward neurons okay so here here's how i understand that you get you get the feeling of some kind of achievement or fulfillment and it's a chemical release in the brain when you get something that you think has value (laughs) the easiest example is that is money let's just say let's just say somebody gives you a check for five grand and you get a release you get you get a release something happens where you're like you feel empowered, you feel that this thing has value, and you feel good. And it, and that we can, here's where it gets crazy, we can control what gives us that emotional reaction towards things. When I was, I was working today and I was, there was a monitor on at, during lunchtime and it showed a guy who had his uh, VW wagon, his VW van uh, fixed up, like some car company took it and they like souped up make it made they made it look really cool pimp my ride something like that and they brought him in and they had him he had his eyes closed and then he opened his eyes and he flipped out he got really really excited and he started crying and i'm looking at this guy and i'm going i'm going man who cares like i absolutely like i it's so funny how he is so excited and emotional about it but but that he he created that in himself because who knows for the span of a year or five years or his whole life he had such a, he put so much value on this thing yeah. and so that it, witnessing that I can also recall things in myself where remember when you were when we were kids and you got like that bicycle or you got the Jinko pants finally and you were like yeah man I feel yeah. so good and you don't you don't say that but you feel it. And as dude, as we get older, th- those things we start to focus them more on like menial stuff, like pretty much like basic survival stuff, like 
man, I'm just glad I paid rent this month or I'm glad I have a car that works or I mean, whatever class level you're at. I mean, you could be a multi-billionaire and say, gosh, well, at least I have this 13 bedroom mansion now because before I was living in a five bedroom mansion. And so you have that feeling of, you have that feeling and dude, here, here's where it's, here's where it's crazy is that all that we can control. And I'm reminded of uh, the Bible where it says, um, the Psalm where it says, um, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Mm -hmm. Now we can sit there and talk about what that line means probably for a very long time, but I have a feeling that it means that we shall not set value to things that are not of God or are, are not God. Mm -hmm. And so like, uh, do not stir up for yourself treasures in, on earth. W what's that mean? I would say, don't put value on anything that is earthly because once you start focusing on worldly things, mm -hmm. you take your focus off of God. And I think Tom, that's what happened. That's what's been happening to us for the course of who knows how long, how many years, but I think individually, and as a society, we are focused on the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, setting our, we're setting up our minds to get stimulated um, when we get these worldly things, either status, um, achievement, finances, material. Um, it could be family. Some people be like, man, I need, to, I need to make the biggest family. I got to have the biggest family, you know, because that to me has value. But it's like, First off, you have the ability to assign value to anything. And I'm just wondering, are we on a right, in the, in the eyes of God, are we up on the right path? And I think that we can definitely change that. But the, the key is to dis, dis, disengage with worldly wants. Yeah. Well, uh to answer your question, I mean, and personally, yeah, I think we are off the path. I, I think so too. I think we're, we're way removed, but I think we're, I personally think we're so far removed that we can't get back to the intended path or the mm. original path because we've evolved too much. But like, I think what gives me great pleasure is, um, the very simple things in life. And, and, and a matter of fact, like, aside from having the equipment to do it, the free things, you know, like hiking and canoeing, you know, and, um, uh, just being out outside with friends, you know, mm. and doing cookouts, things like that. Um, but I think we've evolved too much, at least in America, you know, to get back to like, a simple life. I mean, I guess there are places in America. I mean, you, you like you even go to Amish country, you know. You know, I think it's there. It's just we're so we're we're so inundated with um, other cultures, uh, and I specifically mean just like watching the TV. Every time I go somewhere and I see a TV and I, I watch it for a little bit, I go, man, we. It's so weird. It's like this. It's literally, it's, I feel like it's literal, like brainwashing. And I just don't know that we're doing things right, man. It's, it's, I, I look at the stuff that look just, all you have to do is look at the way people on the TV are reacting to whatever it is that they're doing. And we watch people with smiling faces doing things. And so we're, we're such a, we're, we're, we are so, um, we love to mock. We love to imitate. I mean, that's yeah. what we do when we're young. We imitate. I mean, we eventually just become our parents because we, we just see and then we do the same thing. Monkey and, see, monkey do. Yeah, exactly. And so when, we're, when we grew up watching this culture on TV, for example, you see somebody buying a new car and they're smiling and they're happy. And look, that you see that so much that it just becomes second nature, man. It gets it's so embedded in the subconscious that it's, it's just your being. You don't even think that, at all about it. That's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, I agree with that. I see that mm. I'm conscious and aware of that from time to time. And it's so overwhelming. And I don't think like, I don't see a way out. Yes. Like there, there are times like it's not even possible, but there are times as, where as a, as a, as a collective, 
No, even especially as a collective, but especially, what about as an individual? As an individual, I think it's based on the circumstance. It's easier for some than others, but for me, you know, running a business and having four kids and not being able to take them where I want out of state because of custody. Um, I think there, it, that's a lot more difficult because you have four other personalities or three, you have four other personalities sure. to contend with yeah. that are, that are sucked into that, um, right. that nature. Yeah. You can't be like, you kids, guys, we're uprooting, we're going yeah. to some cave somewhere for yeah. a little bit because yeah. we got to figure things out. I mean, for real, like for real. Yeah, I mean, and you it, can't you can't do that. You you can't because number one, you need to raise your kids and let them be fine. But at the same time, you're like, well, what are you raising your kids into? Yep. It's like, how do you know sending your kids to this college or this school is is what they're supposed to do? It's just like, and I'm not speaking to you directly, but I'm just saying in general, people you send your kids to school because well, that's just what everybody does. Listen to this. That's listen, just the way you do it, man. Exactly. Listen listen to this conundrum, this little um, circumstance. So I have four kids, two in high school, two in elementary, and three of the four kids weren't overly excited about being out in Johnstown school mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> if I wanted to be like, very fair. I would say three of the four kids would probably stick through. I mean, th- the the fourth one's a senior, so this is her last year. But my um, Cameron, my oldest son, wanted to be in New Albany. Mm-hmm. So, like, that's my main focus right there. Mm-hmm. So, I can't, right now, I mean, I'm in the process of moving into New Albany, and I can't find a place. Like, I, I've got a, uh, I've got an application out right now. And if that doesn't go through for the this place that I want to rent, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And school starts in two weeks. Mm-hmm. And But I live in Johnstown, so it wouldn't be anything for me to just enroll the kids into Johnstown. And it's cheaper, and it's, you know, whatever. But um, it, it's like I have so much pressure as a father to want, you know, to give my kids what they want you know the best and i know that it will it will to some degree crush you know cameron if he doesn't get to come to new albany Mm -hmm. you know play Mm -hmm. football for new albany and all this stuff and whether or not that's right or wrong you know like if i sat him down and was like look here's real life situation here's real life circumstances i can't get into new albany Mm -hmm. like i just can't get us in so you got to go through johnstown like, you know, whether that's objectively right or wrong, morally right or wrong, you know, there's a right answer or a wrong answer to how he should take it or not doesn't matter because how he takes it is going to be how he takes it, you know? So even if he should be accepting of it and be like, okay, I understand life's tough, life's not fair, I'm just going to go to Johnstown, the the reality could be, and I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm just saying the reality could be that he resents me or resents his life, you know, and becomes super, um, resentful and, and bitter and angry and, and doesn't put any energy or effort into, you know, applying himself out in Johnstown and then spiraling down. Right. Right. You know, yeah, and then and then the worst case scenario is when he's thirty years old and he's doesn't talk to you for five years because yeah. he's like, "Geez, yeah. dad, you know, you should have put me in that school." And da da da. And yeah. that's gonna be partly his fault. I mean, not partly, but look, man, that's one of the biggest ways to grow out of any kind of hell you might be going through is to take the blame off everybody and just put everything on yourself. You take one hundred percent responsibility for your life, your actions. Even if it's not, if some things aren't your fault, yeah. like, like really, truly, like they're just not your fault. It's good to take that um, power out of anybody else's hand because you're just hurting yourself. Yep. Because the truth of the matter is it's over now and just take full responsibility. And you, you have to be able to have that clarity. You have to be able to have that, that 
that belief in yourself. You know, it's like, okay, you know what? It is fully my responsibility now. Like yeah. I can, I can just go. But the, the trick becomes like, well, then what do you believe? What is there that I can believe in that will give me the strength to do any anything? But yeah. But you know, now we're just now we're kind of going the, the another direction because, well, not not another direction, but that's an also an inter- inter- interesting thing to talk about because then you have to ask yourself, well, what what do I tell myself what's important? Like, how do I really know? Because I'm going to pretty much base what I think has value off of what the world thinks has value or what I, what I think what the world thinks has value. Yep. So it just, you really get yourself in a, in a position where you, it could be very tricky. Am I, what, who am I doing this for? And if I'm doing it for myself, why am I doing that thing for myself? Why do I feel like that's, why is that important to me? Mm-hmm. And if you can answer that question, well, but why? Like who, who, where does that come from? Why is that a part of our, a part of our makeup is that yeah. we can, we can find things that have purpose and, and not, and we can, we have a lot of control to a certain extent to what those things are. So what, well, I mean, let's, Aside from the introduction and all that stuff, wh- what are we aiming at here? What's what's the first thing we need to say and what this book is about? Okay, well, so I hearing he, hearing what we've been saying over the last six months and in this conversation, I would say that our goal is to get somebody that has a perspective of being unfulfilled, unworthy, unhappy, unsatisfied in life and having nowhere to turn necessarily. Which which is the easiest, because look, it says in the Bible, sorry to cut you off, no, you're but fine. It, it says in the Bible, um, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. So it's like, well, why do we want to appeal to those people? Well, first off, we were there. I mean, we're not fully out yet, but we're, we were in a really hard place. And so those are the easiest people to appeal to because those are the ones who are seeking anything just to help the, them get it, out. I would argue that they're the only people to appeal to. And I say that because in Matthew 9, um, 11 and 12, I think it is, Jesus said, um, upon, upon hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a physician, but the sick. Mm. And if you think about that, healthy people, th- they won't look, you know, they don't look mm-hmm. for, um, they don't think they're sick, mm-hmm. you know, so they won't go see a doctor. Yeah. You know, and so. Yeah. Um, and so who, who, what's that saying? Like, who is the sick? You know? And that's, that's the thing what is, is we're, he mean? we're all sick. We're exactly. And, right. But the, the, and I think what he meant by that in a lot of the Bible is um, is the Pharisees, the righteous, the people that think they're righteous, mm-hmm. they are self-righteous. Yeah, those are the people that don't need anything from anybody else. They've got it all figured out, mm-hmm. and God can't help those people, mm-hmm. you know, because they don't need help. Mm-hmm. But they do; they need it the most. Right. And so, um, I I agree with you. I think we're not even. I mean, yeah somebody that's doing great and has a great life. Sure. This book will be a great help to them. Great source of encouragement, great referral, great, um, you know, book to read, to get some, gain some new insights, but really it's for the person that is at the, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, so this is at least one, yeah, one person. Yeah. Is, I'm sure there's people in all different kinds of perspectives. So it's like, who's our audience? I guess that's the question we're asking. Our audience is the person that's on their last, you know, their last strand. Okay. So there's that, which I agree with. But here, I also think this as well. This can also be, and I think you kind of said this, is that this can this can be a kind of a documentation for us to go back and reference and mm-hmm. to, to kind of, check ourselves and say, what was our last, what was our last way of thinking? What, what was our primary focus? Where were we in our minds and in our spirits? Yep. And what's the next step? And 
is is there an end result and and what are we seeking because man i'm telling you i i th this is where it gets really interesting too is your problems consume you and we we have the potential of creating our own problems we can yes. do it there yeah. are some real problems like hey man you didn't eat today and if you don't eat you're gonna die yeah is that such a bad thing well as far as we know yeah you don't want to die so you have this instinct to, to stay alive. And so, all right, it's like Maslow's hierarchy, or is it Maslow's hierarchies of needs is take care of your body first. You got to eat. You got to be. Pavlov. Pavlov was the dog. Yeah, man. Maslow mm -hmm. was the hierarchy. So, um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, uh, kind of like a. I just put down person with little to no hope. Versus, what what would you say that, per, I mean? Um, I, I mean, honestly, what's the, be, I mean, a really good word is lost, you know, yeah. in my opinion, lost. I mean, not to make it sound in a judgmental way, but not whole, not fulfilled, not hopeless. Um, so, yeah. All right, so, in your mind... What do you think is the most important step? Okay, I I mean, look, here's the thing. I I think it's important for you not to think like, oh, we need to appeal to that hopeless person. Just sure. where are you right now? Like what is your thinking? What is it? After all that's already been had, so, okay, so look, you found yourself in a pretty in a low position as as did I, just like psychologically spiritually mentally just like you know you know it's like geez this really sucks man how did you what were the first things you saw and so that i think that we should talk about that and then from that we can write down kind of like the first the first thing well okay so that's that's a great question because it brings up the fact that there are so many different responses and this is my personal one yeah uh, which reminds me of that conversation that you had with Mikey role playing about the suicidal, mm -hmm. you know, guy, um, because I I'm wired differently than anybody else, obviously, but I'm very extrovert and very social person. So my first thing, like the very first thing that I did, because I have been on the other side of depression where I'm like helping people mm -hmm. was to not be ashamed of it so much and to wear it on my sleeves. And I, I'll tell you what I, I'd be, I'd like to hear from people. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from people that knew me, that know me and knew me and interacted with me in the last three years and to hear their, their thoughts on how I, um, presented myself because I, not with like just anybody, but I was pretty open with what was going on in my life. I mean, when people asked me how I was doing, I like, without even thinking, I would be like, I've been better or not so great. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I, I expressed my feelings to a fault. Like if anything, people would accuse me of sharing too much. Yeah. You know? Right. And Cause I, you're not, because you're not supposed to. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In our, in our culture. It's yeah. like, and I, and I, you know, I like, you know, people knew like I, I was like this, this is, this is part of it. I, I was definitely borderline suicidal. Like I always told myself that there's nothing that would make me take my own life. There's, I just couldn't do it, but I would love for a truck to hit me right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, there, I don't think I could get, I could ever get to a place where I was the person that took my own life because you know, my kids, I mean them alone. Like I just, I couldn't do that. But, um, to fantasize about running off the side of the road or, you know, to be in a, a situation where there's a, you know, a gun 
there's a somebody robbing a gas station and then you're like, oh, sweet. <laughs> you know, for the glory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll save everybody. Um, and so, so in the back of my mind, I kind of had this, this idea of if something were to ever happen to me, n- nobody that's close to me could ever say, like, oh, I didn't realize, you know, it was that dark. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, if, um, if. Which is, which is the case with a lot of people, at least from what I understand, because a couple, uh, about a year ago, a woman hung herself. She was mid 40s. She had kids, husband. She was actually a teacher at a school. She left her house at 8 or 9 p.m. one day. And walked across to the woods. This in is right, Maine. right in front of my parents' house, and yeah. she she hung herself in the woods. Mm-hmm. And in the evening, that somebody was somebody, the police came and they saw the house. They said, "Well, the door was open, and there was no signs of struggle. There was no noise. Her husband was there, and so they were like, where did she go?' And um, <clears throat> then they found her, and they're like, "What? What? Like her? Like that lady who my I used to let my daughter play with her daughter, and we would talk all the time. It's like, man." Some people are just really, really darn good at suppressing all that emotion. Mm-hmm. And, that, man, that's... that's and our society, you know, I mean... Because we have to paint that picture. Yeah, man. I we, think we... have got to be the image. I think we... I just... I think we're getting better at it, mental health as a, as a whole. And I think it should probably... We're sp- better masking it? No, no, no. Better at... Uh, I really do think we're probably getting better at a, addressing the elephant in the room as a society. And we're starting, I think, we're just now starting to become a society that is taking mental health serious or seriously and is trying to ex- be accepting of it, more accepting of it. I mean, at least you see campaigns and slogans about it that are like, um, that are, that are encouraging people to be real about it, you know? And, um, but I, but even, but having said that, I, I still think we're, we're not doing that great of a job. I think it's, it's one of those things where, uh, people hear that, but they don't believe it. Yeah, because uh, there's a there's definitely something to be said about h- how something is perceived as an individual, and y- you're you can because you can identify with your your own self versus what like uh, like group identity. So we love we love uh, group thinking. You know, it's like we love to adopt identities that are that a group is a part of that makes us feel social and and stronger. But on the individual basis, it's like um, you might not feel as strong because you're just a separate individual. And so you may not have that confidence in yourself, which I think is messed up. I think it's the wrong way to go about it. <clears throat> so, all right. Well, I, we kind of never really got. So to, well, to answer your question, I, I, the first thing I did was make people aware. Okay. So you make people aware. Okay. And what I wanted to ask you, um, is um, what were you feeling at the time? When you were at your worst place, what were your, what, describe the feeling. What did it feel like? Um, well, you I can start with like your body, the mind, like what did, did it feel like? So uh, like the first thing to set in is, like a lack of motivation to do anything. Um, And I would say energy is probably a factor, you know, just not necessarily feeling like you have the energy to do the things that you want to do or the things that you know you should do. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with the motivation. Um, Also, like, I don't know what feelings you're trying to, to get at, but I, I'm be, just asking. I, like betrayal, like betrayal. No, no, I'm, I'm not. What 
not what you felt that somebody else, because you're you're associating with like, um, like the 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 circumstance. What happened, the circumstance. I, I'm I'm more interested in um. So like lonely, worthless. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. like those not you know worthless. The same thing is like not being valued. Like you just don't matter. Um, another big one is like screw up or failure, you know, like, um, I just make everybody's life worse. Mm. So it would be better. Everybody's life would be better if I wasn't here. And I bet you that's, that is something that everybody experiences when like everybody that's suicidal experiences Yeah, that, that, that is wrong. Like, I bet you, you talk to anybody's family or circle that has committed suicide and you ask them, you know, would you rather them alive? Maybe that's not true. Maybe there are some, you know, just whacked out, you know, drug addict, loser, you know, murderers, thieves or whatever that just live crappy lives that nobody misses them when they're gone. I don't know. I'm just saying, like, I bet you the majority... um, of people that think that people around them that know them would be better off if they were gone mm. are just completely wrong. Yeah. You know, and we just, we have, we have bad perspectives mm-hmm. we get that kind of thinking in our head. It becomes truth, <clears throat> you know, and then we see evidences of it when people get upset when we do things. But in the grand scheme of things, I mean, dude, Anybody would probably do anything to have a loved one back that took their own life. Yeah. You know, like had they just known or whatever. So you spent a good, so there was an, there was an instance that happened and then it made you reflect. And then, so from that, it was your, the constant self-talk you had, which seemed, it would seem to be more, more, more negative than any kind of positive, uh, um, self-talk that you were having with yourself, self-talk that you were having. So you were, you were perpetually thinking about negative qualities and then feeling it, feeling it, thinking it, thinking it, feeling it. And so you were always in that low, low state, right? Well, I mean, it's so, it's so difficult to think about because it's, it's, it's almost like, depression or whatever word you want to use for depression that Mm -hmm. we're talking about is this theme or this thing that that is constant. But even within that, there are other emotions Mm -hmm. somehow within the depression, because even while I was in a season of overall being depressed, there were still a lot of great times. Right. You know? Yeah, so, man. Like, yeah. that's that's what's crazy about it because it it's almost like second to second, mm-hmm. you know, or minute to minute, mm-hmm. hour to hour because it's, it's not, I don't know. I don't know how depression works on a psychological scale of measuring it, but I don't think it just disappears and then you're not depressed and you take your kids out to dinner and you have a great time. Yeah. And then you go back and you're, and then you're depressed. I think it's just, um, it's, it's basically when, when I wasn't active with, um, with something that I enjoyed doing the depression, like when I was free to think about it, Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's another thing that I did to, to combat it is stay as active as I could Mm -hmm. with fun things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think a big part of the reason that I'm still alive today and well is because I kept myself busy. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was lonely, because I split my kids 50, 50 with my ex. And so when I don't have my kids, that's the worst because you just, you don't, you know, your kids value you. They need you. Um, they give you, um, well, they give you value because they value you, right. you know? And so having them there present is, is huge because 
you have to, I mean, if you're a decent parent, you have to step up and fill that role as a parent, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I don't think my, my little kids would ever be able to tell you in 15 years, they'll never be able to say that they saw a difference in me when, you know, when I was going through the depression, like I kept right. myself, you know, uh, I hit it as well as everybody else. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so I kept myself busy. I mean, I, when I, um, when I felt really, really lonely, but here, here's the thing though. And, and I have to say this and people, people that are listening need to hear this is I might be a rare case of depression or whatever you would call it because I've, I spent the, the majority of my life on the other side of it and helping people that were on the other side of it. So I knew things to do when I was depressed. Like I knew, um, like for example, what this psychologists say when you're depressed, just do something. Whatever you do, just do something. Don't do nothing. Because that's when it's, you know, it, that's when it gets the worst. When you're just sitting in bed or you're sitting on the couch, you're doing nothing. And so I knew that. And so even if I didn't want to go out, I would still, I would just go. Mm. I mean, I would just go to um, the local bar or I'd go to um, the mall or a store with no agenda, yeah, just to be out in public, right, right, right. and I beca- and I did that because I knew that that was my sanity, yeah. Because yeah. if not, I was going to lose it, and you know, my sorrow. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, if I if I could tell. And we, we've talked about this before, but if I could tell, um, if I'm on the other side of it and I'm writing a book and I could tell somebody, like, you know, one of the first things I, I would say is um, one of them, it's somewhere in these chapters, is the victim thing that we've been talking about yeah. so much. Is, is not to play the victim. And you said it, man. I mean, take 100% of... Take 100% responsibility. Yeah. Even if you don't, even if it's not yours, take it. And then that enables you to move on and yeah. move forward. It doesn't give anybody else any power to hurt you or whatever. Yeah. So one thing that was very powerful for me was when I came across, uh, people who are talking about emotions being a re- related to um, states of vibration and frequency. Like mm-hmm. when I started to think about things like that differently, when I started to have this perspective that the universe operates um, fundamentally on uh, these levels or, or mm-hmm. in that way, it made me start to identify with being something that had control of my emotions and, and mental state um, instead of instead of identifying with emotions and and being in being in the living the emotion and perpetually uh, identifying myself with it which would just uh, persist the emotion then um, I was able by identifying through that new knowledge, I seemed much easier to get out of it. So that was very powerful for me. I don't know if that had any effect on you or if you were exposed to that. No, like the vibrations and yeah. So like I sent you that video a while ago, the <laughs> one where he talks about how the it, the video just starts it starts talking about your brain and how there's different. Um, how you, there's a neural network and how uh, the, these things fire and this happens and it's all it all can be decoded to like electrical. Um, uh, it it could all be uh, translated to like electrical signals, you know, like emotions, and um, so that made me start to think like, wait a minute, 
what if I, what if I'm just like this ball of um, electrical energy and when I'm in a certain vibrational state, I, I feel these certain emotions and you can kind of really simplify it because we can look at people's specific situations and then say, oh man, that sucks. Like you went through divorce. Oh, that sucks. Like your dad killed himself. Like that sucks. Like, oh, that sucks. You grew up in poverty and your mom left when you were five. Like these are all very specific happenings. But, and then the worst thing is to identify specific, to identify with that and be very specific about, um, that identity and, and really, um, really identifying with it and, and, and identifying means you like really, really hold on to all that feelings and emotion. And that's just who you are yeah. and you, and some people can live with that for the rest of their life. And, um, so, but that, that to me is lack of awareness. But once you start thinking about it, if you allow yourself to kind of uh, expand or if you come into that knowledge, then for what, for, for whatever reason, you just have a different perspective and things shift that's what happened to me and so what i find interesting if if in fact the universe does operate like that then things operate at different frequencies there's different levels of vibration and so it was i was interested when you were talking about how do you have like depression and then you have like your ups and downs in the in in depression well yeah. that's kind of how like um certain like uh like sound waves and uh electrical waves it, so like you can be in a bandwidth you know and you can say well yeah. this this bandwidth this frequency level whatever it is whatever spectrum whatever scale it's that's on well you're oh. you're operating it like that oh yeah oh do we have a leg marker yeah okay so like i don't know if so that's gonna... yeah that kind of sucks but what? well i don't know if it's going to come up on camera but let me just quickly like Okay, so let's just say that that's depression, yeah. you know, and so you're you're pretty much just moving. Your waves are stuck in that bandwidth, but no matter no matter what it is, if it's high or low, if you're feeling good or feeling bad, it's still in the band that bandwidth of depression. Yeah, and so, and maybe that's like what the seven chakras are, like in like in. Have you heard of the seven yeah. chakras and all that? All that goodness. Taoism or no, it's Buddhism? like I think yeah, Hinduism. Buddhism. I, I don't know. I didn't study it too much, but um, so you had like seven. Like this is like the feet, and then you have your head, and then it's so yeah. it's like if you're operating at a low frequency, then you're you're very much in like the primitive state, you know. And so I think that I think these bands exist, and I think that the higher you go, the more I don't know enlightened you are, whatever the word is, whatever the proper. Say, call it what you want. It is a thing. And I just think it's just like a level of frequency you're operating at. And at that, at certain different levels, different things are made available to you as far as in terms of happiness, imagination, and um, knowing or being aware of certain things that you wouldn't be in if you weren't at, if you were at lower, dip, at lower uh, bandwidths. So, um, so that... <clears throat> that perspective shifted things. And I think it's true. I think that emotions can be simplified to vibration and, and frequencies and, st and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, so to, to make like the first concrete, um, let's just say chapter, the, the first, the first thing that let's just say, Chapter one, and let's just list five things we should talk about, and then the next podcast we could talk about. That. Okay. So like perspective. So the first thing, in no particular order, let's just list five well, that we think is is very um, important. So you're saying perspective, right? Yeah. Okay. Perspective. I say also one of the things that I think is identity. Okay identifying with whatever it is that you identify with would you say biology would be a good one explain it 
like when I say biology, I'm thinking about how we could use maybe we could use biology as a way of bringing in vibrations, bringing in epigenetics, bringing in um, these other these like sub subtitles, you know, because if you can like when you listen to um, Ravi Zacharias, Peterson and Lipton, you I mean, I would I, unless I'd say the majority of people walk away and they can't really refute what has been said. Because they just they're like, I mean, they just speak with such truth, you know, and confidence, like all three of them in, in their different fields of expertise, you know, mm-hmm. like when I hear Bruce Lipton speak, I mean, there, I'm sure there are some things that he has said along the way that I don't agree with necessarily, or I don't resonate with, but this, you know, the majority of the stuff he says I hear it and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is scientific fact. Yeah. These are laws. And so if like once I understood those, once I understand what he's saying, then I'm like, then I realize, oh my gosh, yeah, there's hope. There's a solution. Mm-hmm. I can change the, you know? Yeah. And so I think, um, I think if we can have a have a chapter maybe not the first chapter but have a chapter about biology and how even if you don't believe that we got here by god by a creator to understand that you are a chemical makeup and this is how you were put together and um here's the components of that mm-hmm. and here's how they work then you can start to understand the universe better mm-hmm. You know, so I, I, when I say biology, I'm just thinking about epigenetics. I'm thinking about vibrations. I'm thinking about, um, psychology, you know, um, the mind Mm -hmm. and I, and I just use bio biology as a blanket to, you know, encompass all that. Yeah. Okay. So we got perspective, identity, biology for, let's get two more. What, what else is. Well, I mean, that is a lot because it's the, not like that's a lot of content. You're right, but I think it's good. Let's just let's just write down two more just yeah. for fun. How would you, um, how would you put it? And I'm not saying that this should be on here, but if it is, how would you phrase this idea of, or this thought that we were talking about of how the the social norms and society puts rules on things, mm-hmm. or, um being brainwashed or, you know, like what, how would you phrase that? Because I think it's good to, I think it'd be good to talk about that at some point on talk about how, why we believe the things we believe, Mm -hmm. you know, that, that are just passed down to us from. Yeah. Like I think, I think a good, a good word is uh, conditioning. Yeah. Um, cause brain, you know, I mean, brainwash, that's one thing. Um, but like social conditioning, cultural conditioning. So I think like the, 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 the key word is conditioning. Like yeah. how we're, um, and, and that's just one word. I mean, there might be a better one. I um, put human conditioning, but anyway, there are, that's fine. And then, uh, you put perspective and then you have, yeah. How we're conditioned like culturally, socially, um, what are these two? Biology, identifying identity. No, what's this? I, that's identifying. Okay. Uh, but I, I put identity and identifying. Okay, what do you got for the last one? What do you think? So perspective, identity, biology, um, conditioning, and... Um, okay, so let's think like... The most important things, um, the the most important steps that, what about value? What what about value assignment? I I actually think value assignment. I'm 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 just writing down for myself, but we, we we could add it if you like. But I think that's a really really big. That also goes. That also ties in with I think conditioning. 
because yeah because you got to ask yourself the question is what gives you what do you think has value and why mm-hmm. why does it have value what do you hold on to yeah i think that's good and it deals with purpose and it it deals with you know feeling worthless and mm-hmm. and culture and everything else we're we're talking about yeah cuz i'm so fascinated with um like the value thing and like what stimulates your what stimulates you every single day and look we we love um what's familiar right yeah. we've talked about that many times and man i witness time and time again people who complain about things a lot but they never change because they've been complaining about it so long so for so long that it's become familiar to them comfortable so now it's like what gives me the satisfaction is complaining about the problems that I have but never actually taking care of them because if I take care of them I'm in a new space and I don't know how to react I don't mm-hmm. know it's all unfamiliar man it's like when you move into a new or drive into a new neighborhood or new city you're just like you're completely disoriented and, not me. And yeah. you feel you feel odd. You feel like I don't know what to do. You feel weird, and it's not familiar, man. So we, we um, we don't like the unknown. So we don't like the unknown. So, I so I think that that right there, that whole subject matter is fascinating to me, and that's what Lipton talks about a lot. I heard an article, read an article, did something with an article uh, a decade ago, where. Um, you did something with it. Yeah, did you I mean, write it. I <laughs> might have. I don't know if I g- skimmed it. I don't know if I read it. I don't know if it. Exist. It could not exist. Um. Anyway, you've heard it. It's this idea that gamblers and addicts. Well, gamblers are addicted to the loss. Or whatever. Oh, you re- you did write that. It's in your book. Yeah. You. You read that. Yeah, they're addicted to the loss. Yeah. Because, what's the reason? Or are they addicted to loss? The, I don't know. I, it's just is it, are they addicted to loss more than winning? They're they're addicted to the feeling of it. Like mm-hmm. they get um, the stimulation of it mm-hmm. just as much as you know the winning is losing. I don't know. I'm like paraphrasing, but it's this idea yeah. of that the loss is yeah. is a reward almost. Right, right, right. And and nobody would accept that or say that mm-hmm. you know and be like oh yeah i don't i love losing that's why i keep gambling mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. but you look at it or whatever you know psychologists yeah. have looked at it and said yeah that the actual the negative effects of this action are yeah. causing your brain and body to feel a certain way mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that's why you keep doing it just as much as the thought of winning mm-hmm. um yeah all right, so, well, I mean, we got these down, and then uh, we can play around and see how we want to eventually format this. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, any uh, last things you want to say? Can we? No. Uh, that, that's all. Mm-hmm. I'm digging the setup. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, all right, well, then we'll... We'll see you guys next week. See ya.